uh, introduce yourselves, starting with you, John. Yeah, so my name is John Moore. I am with uh, Camarazzi Corporation. I'm from Canada, um, actually Ottawa, Canada, where I think last year's uh, uh, event was held. And uh, I've been in IT, somebody said it yesterday, they wouldn't admit to doing over 20 years, but I'm over 20 years, so. um, and been in the business a long time. So um, bringing, uh, in Canada anyway, to hold the whole transformation um, movement, Stephanie's movement there, the whole transformation movement um, is taking off, and I think uh, there's no real um, IC vision or process like IT for IT, so that's what Camarazzi is bringing to the table is um, focusing on IT for IT, focusing on mapping to business value, mapping back to the services, and I love hear, hearing Stephanie talk about services because IT never talks enough about services. So, um, so yeah, so that's what we're, uh, that's what we're doing and um, pleased to be here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Fulton, uh, 25 years in IT, last 10 plus in strategy and architecture roles. I am currently working for Nationwide. Uh, we are on your side. Um, and um, for all of the international folks, you may not know that as our jingle. Um, but uh, I am currently heading up their technology innovation um, department. Before uh, Nationwide, I spent 20 years at uh, Procter & Gamble, and then a couple of years as an IT strategy and architecture consultant and uh, Chief Digital Officer, so. Oh, and I co-chair the forum. I was gonna say, there's something about the, the chair of the forum in there, too. So. Something about that. Okay, so Lars Rosen. I know a lot of you guys here in the room. Um, I've been in IT for more than 25 years. <laughs> Just, it seems to be the standard thing to say when you're in, in this forum. Um, I work in MicroFocus. Um, I've didn't get a job there, I was acquired in, and I've been through the acquisition route and four or five times or something like that. Um, it's always fun, but it also implies a lot of uh, transformation, so I'm kind of indirectly becoming expert in that, but my day job is um, cross-portfolio strategy for uh, our organization, and uh, I had the uh, core group that uh, steward the, um, the, uh, the normative part of the IT for IT standard. Yes, so uh, yeah, Lars and, and uh, Carl here are kind of the, the, so the key sort of founders and kind of instigators, I guess, for getting the standard off the off the uh, uh, off the, the shelf and on into the world, real world here. Yeah, so it's, we can have them to thank for that. Somebody to blame, <laughs> yeah, for all for all this work and all this great the knowledge. Post emotional posters. There. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and some I'm sure resonated more than others. Um, okay, so with that, I'm going to get started with the panel. Uh, and so the, the, the one thing that kind of struck me is uh, digital enterprise. So I know we're working through some op opportunities to define that as a forum. Some of the forums are working on that. But in your words, um, please define digital enterprise. So Mike, I'm going to pick on you first. Okay. So for me, a digital enterprise is all about uh, an enterprise that is using technology uh, to transform its business model and its engagement with customers. Simple, sweet, okay. Lars, anything that to add? Um, sure, you could say that in many ways, an awful lot of companies today are becoming digital enterprises and it's, a, it's not a black and white. It's, uh, it's something around using more technology in the delivery of the service. But another way of saying it is, if what's in your service catalog on your web page is something you sell to the customer, not something you sell to your internal organization, then you're probably a digital enterprise. Uh, but it's not a precise definition, nevertheless. Yeah. And how about you, John? Um, I think it's about, like Mike said, driving um, business acceleration, innovation, um, and using technology. I mean, if you think about the digital only or native digital organizations that thrive on, that's all they make money on is using digital, so. Yeah, there, yeah. yeah, and I've seen that, you know, uh, companies are, are predicated on the technology that they have. They don't exist unless the technology is there assisting to deliver their products or services. Yeah, I think there's a, an important, 
point around what's different about digital enterprise today versus what we've been as organizations um, for a long time. Um, and for me, uh, we've, we have applied technology to improve our businesses for as long as IT's been around. Um, it's been the job of enterprise architects to transform businesses. Um, for me, though, I think the, the shift uh, from digital it, that, that is really key is that rather than looking primarily inside the company within, what's our, con in, within our control, um, which is where we historically have operated as IT, um, we're, we're t turning outside. We're, we're starting to look at um, things beyond the walls of our company. And that's, to me, the biggest shift that's happening in this digital evolution. Yeah. I would agree. Ideas not, come from anywhere, anywhere and everywhere. But it's always important when a new trend comes around and the digital enterprise is a buzzword these days, honestly, um, to think about, well, what's the first digital enterprise we had? And I guess it's probably at and started about 120 years ago, uh, because fundamentally it was technology service that was delivered as a service, um, and nothing really changed since. Well, that's not completely true, but if you look at the telco business and what they did, especially when they digitized the telco uh, transmission net, um, it was very much a digital enterprise. But it's also interesting to see all the pitfalls they had and all the wrong things they did in that process, and let's make sure we don't repeat that when we do it for the rest of the industries. No, great definitions. I, I, I love all those. Uh, next thing I want to really expand on here is what are your concerns with the increased challenges facing the businesses today, given that shift to digital enterprise? So and I'll pick on you, uh, you Mike. You're the quietest. <laughs> <laughs> How often does that happen? I'm the quietest, right? Um, give me a few minutes to get warmed up, apparently. Um, so I think for me, when I look at the, the biggest challenges, uh, the pace of change, first and foremost, is, um, is the number one challenge that I see uh, facing enterprises all around the world. Um, I think as we uh, look at how rapidly technology is evolving, it's just becoming very difficult for uh, organizations to keep up with that. And so I think we have to think about new ways of working uh, to be able to keep up with that pace of change. Yeah, it's, again, I'll go back to my, my telco example, um, learning from the past. One of the things they didn't manage to transform when they transformed into digital was to be agile. Um, it took 20 years to introduce uh, ISDN and 12 years to introduce ADSL um, because there wasn't this competitive environment. Um, and also at the same time, it was very clear that they absolutely hated IT and didn't use the knowledge in IT and being smarter about what to do compared to doing the way they've always been doing it. So I think that um, Charlie, if he's in the room, maybe he's not, uh, said it uh, correctly the other day around, uh, no, not the other, the other session, earlier today, uh, that finance is an example of a line of, uh, or a um, corporate function that people sort of respect. You need to understand finance, but you also respect that finance are the ones that really understand the bigger scheme of how it all works across the countries and what have I. But there doesn't seem to be the same respect of saying, well, there are some professional IT people that can help the line of business and vice versa. That doesn't exist. And if you don't establish that, you're going to fail. So, I mean, really the incorporation of IT into the, to the business mix, basically, is involving IT versus being Correct. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Good point. How about you, John? Um, I find it, and I don't necessarily think it's geographic, but I find, you know, I like the fact that Stephanie came before us because she talked about the silos. Yeah. I, fa I found that over the many years, um, the struggle that organizations have in just changing the way they do things, and with what Mike said, the pace of change that's happening, um, they have no choice but to now start to change the way um, they deliver services, and not from a silo perspective, et cetera. But the disciplines in changing that, and the uh, the force, I guess, the um, the mandate to be able to do it, it's a, it's a it's a a big cultural shift that has to go on. I find that one of the challenges as well. Yeah, 
Yeah, some say that changing culture is harder than anything else, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we talked, there's another thing that we talked about earlier that, that you were highlighting as we were prepping for the session, John. The, uh, one of the things that's, that's going on uh, that's an increasing challenge for organizations all over the world is um, data privacy. Um, and, and legislation associated with that. Um, and the introduction of GDPR and, um, and all of the, the various implications of that, um, it, it's, it's a challenge for businesses to understand how to handle that, how to keep up with that, how to anticipate what's coming next. So I think that's another challenge we mentioned. I would also kind of build on that to say just the importance of, of data and what's possible with, um, with data. I'll give a shout out to my uh, my colleague Don Brancato over there from the Open Platform Three Forum, um, and and all of the work that they're doing in there to um, identify standards around data interchange um, and standards around data lakes and and big data platforms. Um, I think the the volume of data that is available to businesses and the ability to make decisions. Um, in different ways using uh, advanced technologies like artificial intelligence. Um, it, it's, it's increasingly becoming uh, difficult to understand what are the right things to do and what are the things not to do. Um, I, I could talk for a long time, maybe we'll get into some of this, uh, about how that's impacting us in the insurance industry. You're getting warmed up? I am starting up. to get warmed up a little. All right, all right. Well, that's good, that's good. Um, well, and, the, and this next question is for you, Lars, because you touched on it in your last answer, which is, which is the, what's the role of IT in, and how is it becoming more important to these digital businesses as they try to transform? What, what, do we can, what can we do in IT to make that better? I don't think there is a single answer at the moment. Everybody is struggling with it, and, and unfortunately, many organizations are also struggling with the fact that culturally, everybody hates IT because they are the ones that are hindering stuff to happen, et cetera. Uh, everybody also hates finance, but they accept it exists, right? Um, I guess. Um, they sign the paycheck. They, they sign the paycheck. It's not the same with IT. Uh, I, I think there's a couple of places. That one is the sort of on the corporate level, you can simply say, well, give governance, risk and compliance, the GDPR uh, things, and, and also security in general. Lines of business can't figure out how to do that, period, right? It, it, it needs to be something that is handled by a professional unit that concentrate on that corporate-wise. Uh, but do it with all of these digital services that is being introduced. Um, the other thing is that IT itself needs to think much more about being a platform provider. Mm -hmm. So creating that uh, catalog, uh, operational catalog, where you have service available that the lines of business IT really needs. And that's the shift of thinking for IT from being a cost center, where if you want something to do, you come with a bag of money and then wait nine months and you get it, to a, a business center that predicts what the lines of business need and provide those platforms and services that the lines of business need. That's a, that's a cultural shift, and that's the, the biggest hindrance we have at the moment. See the table. How about you, John? What do you think? Well, just to go from cost center to, no pun intended for gas and oil, but service center. The, the idea of that exactly. Um, I think I think IT's role, just because of what's coming down from a technology perspective, I think is much more important. What I've also seen is that over time, as to what Lars said, where IT seemed to be the, the wall to get beyond, and uh, I work a lot with the federal government in Canada that went from you know, 78 different departments into one shared services and could not deliver services for years to those departments. Took all their money, but, <laughs> but didn't deliver any services, to the point where the departments went out and started getting cloud services, bypassing shared services and IT altogether. So it's, it's like there's, there's an important delivery role there, and, and the other point I look at is the fact that um, if you think about uh, traditional organizations with IT, um, a lot of um, compliance, regulatory, all of those things. And then let's think about the digital native organization where they kind of have forgotten about compliance altogether. That's why the IT role uh, for traditional organizations, I think, is very important. One of the struggles I think the digitally native organizations are going to have is within the compliance side of it. They're going to have to engineer it backwards. Come back in. Exactly. That's where. Yeah, where I think 
that's why the rule, as we start seeing more uh, data coming in, artificial intelligence, a lot of the standards and compliance um, pieces of the puzzle that need to be addressed by IT. Agreed. Agreed. So. I, I, I can't help just making one more comment to what you're making of statement here is that, again, comparing to the financial department CFO, I don't think any company in their right mind would believe that they outsource uh, the CFO role. Uh, they might use a lot of service providers, Deloitte, Pricewaterhouse, whatever, to help them doing the finance, but they know that they are responsible. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so there is this trend, or was this trend, that, okay, the IT is something we outsource because we can't figure out how to do it, we get somebody else to do it, right? And it's okay to outsource some functions, but you are still responsible for IT, right? And, and that is that is what the organization needs to learn. Unfortunately for some, it's going to be the hard way. Yeah, as we've seen, and Mike, I know you've got some, you're, you're sort of right in the path of that, you know, how can IT help innovate in the business, right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's it's interesting. I think I think it's an interesting time uh, that we're that we're in right now. And uh, to to use Lars's example of the finance organization, you would you would never hear Nationwide turn around and say we're a, an accounting company. But our CEO recently uh, was heard saying that Nationwide is no longer an insurance company. Nationwide is now a technology company that happens to sell insurance. And I think that speaks to the, the transformation that's going on in industries all across the world. It speaks to the importance of, of information technology. It speaks to um, the, the transformation and the role that IT is playing in the business. And, and it's really important for us to step up to the plate as IT professionals uh, to that challenge. So I think, uh, I think we all have to be doing more. I think we all have to be um, looking out ahead, um, uh, trying to set the path for the organization and, and figure out how we're going to take these, um, these emerging technologies I think we'll talk about in our next question um, and identify the new what's possibles yeah. and, and help um, utilize those what's possibles to, to solve real customer problems. Well, and so keep the mic there because, I mean, what I would like to understand is how you're doing that. I know it's part of your role is to go out there and look externally and bring some of this interesting technology back to the business. What, what is that? What, what, what technologies are you finding? What are you draw, what's driving your business? Um, so for, for my team specifically, we have a couple that we're, we're looking at. Uh, we're looking at um, blockchain. Uh, we think that's going to be fairly impactful to the, the financial services and insurance industry. Um, we're looking at artificial intelligence. Again, with all of the, the data we have as we try to do underwriting on our customers, um, uh, the artificial intelligence that we'll be able to use to, to do better underwriting is really important to us. Um, we're, um, we're still continuing to uh, look at ways that we as an organization can leverage kind of a, a platform model. Um, utilize APIs and microservices in a, in a platform mentality. Um, so that's another key area. And, and we're starting to, to take a look at um, artificial, in, or not artificial intelligence, um, virtual reality and augmented reality, and trying to figure out how that's going to um, change how we interact with and embrace our customers um, going forward. But probably the most interesting thing I would say that um, that we've come up with as a as a team over the last year has been that we don't believe that the new technologies are the important piece. Um, what we think is actually the really critical thing um, is identifying not the one technology that's going to be most impactful, but what are the technology convergences? How are multiple technologies going to come together and combine in new and interesting ways and, and allow us to do things that we were never able to do before. Uh, and so to me, that's what that's the kind of thing that we're trying to focus on. How are we going to use IoT and blockchain and artificial intelligence together and converge those into an interesting solution? As we look a little further out, how are we going to uh, leverage quantum computing and um, AI and uh, 5G when we, when we think of, uh, as, as was mentioned in, in one of the keynotes this morning, uh, living in a world of abundance, um, quantum computing and 5G really 
dramatically change what's possible when it comes to um, compute, compute capacity. And so we've, we've, we're trying to think about how those convergences are really going to change, fundamentally change the game. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. And what about you, Lars? What do you think? Um, quite a number of things. Uh, I, I, I like to put it under the hat of uh, freakless, freak, I can't say that word actually, freakless, uh, <laughs> compute that is easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, no, I did not drink beer today, but anyway, um, getting to it eventually. Uh, the, the, the concept of actually making stuff easy to use. Um, uh, commoditization. Uh, that, that it's, it's not just it's commoditized, but actually make complex stuff easy. Mm. And, and uh, because that goes back to the agility. So you can say that's part of making platforms uh, work uh, seamlessly. Uh, it's, it's also something like the um, uh, old technology to make sure that you can use old technology in the new settings. Mm. We got, I don't know how many billion lines of COBOL code running on mainframes. Uh, it happens to be my business, so it's shameless plug here. But how can, but, but nevertheless, it's actually a gross business for us. Uh, double digit gross in, in COBOL, right? Um, and that's because all of these backend systems written in COBOL, they will support the digital enterprise. Mm -hmm. And you're not gonna rip out in, in your insurance business necessarily all your, your COBOL mainframes, uh, but how can we make it frictionless? It was almost correct. Uh, Frickland test. <laughs> <Frickland -less>. You got it. <laughs> you got it, right? Uh, I didn't have to think about the word, then it was easier. Um, and and, and to, to make sure that you can actually make those updates in an agile manner so that you can get your stuff out the door. Um, and that's, again, not thinking about the next new technology, but thinking about this thing. The other one is obviously big data and what comes with that. Um, yeah. It's going to change the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how to consume, how to leverage the technologies that are complicated much more easily every day. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. How about, any thoughts, John? I would even I would even say that aside from and, and Mike, you're in that role of looking at newer technologies coming. But I, even just using technologies that have been around for a while, and maybe to the point that Lars saying, it not necessarily being easy to use them. But I, I mean, I think of how many organizations in specifically in IT are not automated to the max or not using orchestration and tools and solutions that have been around to be able to do that um, for a long time. Um, so even even existing technology, I think that um, IT is not necessarily using to, uh, for benefit. And then the other thought that I was thinking about is when you think about what's happening with um, uh, container technology and not just the technology, but the ability to build uh, applications. Somebody said this at a, a few months ago about everything being designed and built now from an application is meant to fail. Think about that for a sec. It's meant to fail. Whatever happened to when we backed up systems and we did we did synchronous replication and all of those things? Those things are going to go away when you start having, you know, applications that are meant to to fail and recover. And that's happening now. So uh, the imp I think the implication, and this is a little off topic, but I think um, the implications to how IT manages those services uh, as new applications as well come on, I think is important. Yeah, I would I would build on that. And this uh, this is something that I was having a conversation with earlier, and, and maybe it's a uh, a little provocative for uh, for the open group, but I, I would say. Um, the the technologies that that we're faced with now, as well as uh, some of the, the the methods we're using as IT professionals to deal with those, are in some ways making architecture obsolete. And I would also profess to say that the the pace of change, the speed with it, which we're being uh, impacted by technologies, is making architecture more important than it's ever been before. And so there's an interesting dichotomy there uh, where um, I think uh, a lot of organizations are struggling w with the mixed message. And they're struggling with what to do with this role of an architect um, and where it fits in their world. And so particularly here in this open group conversation, um, I think the, the role of an architect in a digital enterprise will, will continue to be an interesting uh, conversation as that role morphs going forward. 
I, I think some of the DP box stuff is trying to address that in a way, right? Is mm -hmm. uh, kind of define the new jobs and the new requirements for those roles, you know? Perfect. Yeah, very good. Um, so we're here in Houston, you know, uh, gas energy is sort of the theme. A any thoughts about the impacts of uh, going digital, right? Uh, we heard some pretty interesting things earlier today around, uh, well, again, again it's, uh, what is it, sub, sub, uh, Surface. Looking underground, <laughs> subterranean uh, data. So Sub this whole surface. new subsurface. That's right, subsurface. Uh, yeah, and of course our shell folks would know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think there's going to be some interesting uh, evolutions we're seeing. I, I would never expect to see that new forum pop up, but I can understand why it's there. Uh, any thoughts around the gas and oil industry impacts of all going digital? Any any anything else? Yeah, maybe I can. Because I, 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 I got to sit in on a lot of the process automation mm -hmm. stuff the last yesterday. Um, and you know, as I, as I was listening to the, to the open process uh, automation forum and the discussions around it, um, OT isn't my thing, but IT is. I kind of looked at those worlds converging. And we're, we're using digital everywhere in, in the oil and gas space, or we will be. Um, so certainly. Um, looking at from that perspective, I, I, I have, being from Canada, there's a lot of oil and gas in Canada. Um, and some of the challenges I think uh, that we face, at least in Canada, um, is um, the cost of, of the oil and gas, getting it out of the ground. Uh, we have uh, tariffs now, trade wars going on. All sorts of things that's uh, driving the cost of pulling that out of the ground. So I, I, what I see is that the those organizations need to find innovative ways um, of getting the oil out, selling the products, etc. And they really have to think of it from the business perspective how they can use technology uh, to be able to do that. And I think I think the, the, the you know we've seen the pricing pricing of oil going up and down. Uh, continually. Uh, one of the other things, and I made the comment before, uh, in working with oil and gas in Canada, um, they are extremely so siloed when it comes to their organization, and, and uh, even, even from the IT perspective. Um, and one of the things that they sh should be looking at, but they're really not uh, driving towards, uh, is a lot of the automation. I heard about uh, you know the, the the concept yesterday about uh, the maintenance of a lot of the um, assets that are involved uh, in the whole process. Um, a lot of these things that can be automated, even to the point where uh, automated failover of devices, etc. A lot of these are controlled now through as as they add uh, smarts into these devices and assets uh, can be controlled. Uh, and also uh, can be made more reliable and start to reduce the amount of manpower involved with it. So I think there's a tremendous amount of savings uh, and, and, and business drivers of using technology in oil and gas. Uh, and I can see it, uh, you know, I can see it as the, the whole open process automation part becomes more. Kind of converges important. with the IT. Exactly. Point. Yep. Yep. Point. And I know not everybody on the stage has that, the gas and oil experience. I know, Lars, you're, you're, you've had some telecom, some deep telecom experience there. What do, what do you say? Well, it's, it's, uh, the telecom experience was also that they were really slow in uptake on, on automation mm. uh, and, and, in general, making the digital business truly efficient until there were disruptors coming in. Skype being the, the classical mm -hmm. example, but, mm -hmm. but there was others uh, coming along, right? And I guess it's the same in oil and gas. It's um, to really get a fundamental shift in, in how you think and, and how you operate, you need to um, uh, to look at what are the disruptors coming in. And obviously one of them in, in, in that sector is, well, the uh, the um, the other kind of energy sources. Um, so I come from Denmark. 100% uh, of our electricity is from wind on a good day. Um, and, uh, and and electricity prices gets negative and, and stuff like that, mm. uh, and and it's 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 a completely different industry that has popped up that is very digital actually in in, in how you operate windmill parks and stuff like that, and that gives another pressure into the energy business. Right. I do think there is another uh, um, 
things happening, and that could be a disruptor which is coming from the perspective of traditionally energy has been a very physical uh, business. So it's, it's people and trucks and pipelines and stuff like that. Um, but as it gets digitalized, uh, everything is controlled, everything is networked, etc. The threat model, how do you disrupt a business, is suddenly something that can happen from North Korea or whatever. Um, and, and there is a disaster waiting to happen. I'm pretty sure that it isn't good enough what we're doing and something will happen and then there will be a shift going on. Uh, unfortunately, I think we need to learn the hard way typically on, on this, but it's bound to happen in the, in the oil and gas in my view. About your industry, yeah. yeah, I can. Um, I've talked already about insurance, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit from my background uh, at Procter & Gamble about uh, consumer packaged goods and retail. Um, both of those industries have been fundamentally transformed by um, by digital, and, and you can look at uh, retail with Amazon, how it's completely uh, flipped the entire model. Uh, but in the, in the packaged goods space, I'll use the example of Dollar Shave Club. Um, Gillette, if you're not familiar with Dollar Shave Club, Gillette it was, uh, at least in the U.S., um, the uh, number one um, brand in the razor business with something like, I, I want to say it was like 75 or 80 percent market share. Just incredibly unheard of uh, from a standpoint of dominating a single line of business. Well, this little company that was basically out of somebody's garage started selling subscriptions for razors over the internet and eventually was bought by Unilever for, uh, I, I don't know what it was, but it was some astronomical figure uh, after taking a massive chunk out of that Gillette business. Um, fundamentally disrupted um, how Gillette thought about their market um, and about how they would uh, interact with their customers and, um, and there were ripple effects across the entire industry. And that's an, uh, an example of how digital enterprises are impacting things around the world. Yeah. I, I think you can't go anywhere anymore and, and not notice some sort of disruption, right? Tra and transformation, uh, transportation. Um, there's uh, you know, even, even rockets, right, that guide themselves back to Earth, which was unheard of a couple of years ago. It's also uh, just, just to add something that Mike had said about Amazon. We all remember Amazon starting off and buying buying books, and then uh, compute. And then I'm, I'm watching yesterday, I think it was a presentation about uh, the electric grid deregulation, and I'm going, okay, at what point I would be able to buy electricity from Amazon? <laughs> well, right. in Texas, we, we can buy our, our electricity from any source, actually, because we are, um, the, the market is opened up. So I don't know, anybody else exactly here in Texas? Exactly. Ah, you know what I'm talking about. So, so yeah, you can sign up for your own provider, and uh, there's different, you know, suppliers. Actually, in, in, in Denmark, where you can do that as well, we yeah. are very happy that both Google, Facebook, and uh, I don't know Amazon, but um, Apple uh, yeah. place data centers in little small Denmark. Uh, but yes, we can sell them a lot of uh, <laughs> energy. But they bought it in Norway uh, <laughs> because that's it's an open market. There yeah, as it's well. an open market. So I, I think that uh, idea of open market and really that supply chain optimization is kind of ruling the roost here, and it comes from just getting a ride to the airport or getting a product at your door. Well, and it's interesting because it's it's no longer just digital disruption, but it's actually now the fear of disruption is fundamentally impacting markets. Um, a, a real life example that's only a couple of months old, uh, Amazon announced that they were, I think it was with uh, Berkshire Hathaway and Aetna maybe, going to take a look at rethinking uh, health insurance. And I believe in the next couple of days, the market basically took 20% out of every other healthcare provider that was publicly traded Absolutely. because of that fear of disruption. And so uh, digital is, is, even just the, the thought of it is having an impact. Yeah, you can't stay still anymore. There, there's right. no room for staying still and waiting for things to happen. They won't happen. So I, I think we're um, at time. We only have about 10 minutes left. I wanted to ask to see if anybody from the audience has a question for the panel. Don, you've got to have questions. You, you and if you do, let's use the mic. Uh, I think um, you're going to turn it on for us in the back. Thank you very much. Do you have a question? Yeah. <laughs> you want to say your name and company? 
My name is uh, Wout Last from Hint. I have a question uh, related to process automation. Um, there's a lot of data coming from sensors, and uh, all those data is going into data historian, but it's all unvalidated. What are your thoughts about dealing with those kinds of data? So, um, it's, it, it's not a, there, there's not a simple silver bullet to, to solve it. There's a lot of experimentation going on. I think there's, there's two things that we see. One being that um, there's a need for a platform. And platform is more than just a database. It's, it's, it's really a platform that allows you to collect, uh, normalize, enrich, uh, and, and then uh, explore the data, and then act on it. Uh, and if you need to build all of that yourself in order to get your business goals out of it, uh, it's going to take too long. So uh, having such a platform and, and being able to buy that or consume it from the from the cloud is going to be important. The other thing is the and 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 Don, my good colleague and friend, would would talk at length on on, on this is the the latency thing. We just had a discussion yesterday. You can't necessarily expect that you will put all the data from all of these uh, things into the cloud. Um, because you need to react faster, there's too much data, so you will have much more distributed compute and storage uh, at the edge, uh, and that's a new model. We're not used to managing that, so it'll create an enormous management challenge um, to, to get to that point. Yeah, and, and when you say at the edge, you mean where it's produced, basically. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, so as we think about uh, all of the sensors and what they're producing data, w one of the things that, that we did uh, within my technology innovation team was was we actually looked at utilizing some of the, the advanced technologies that we had to create new ways of visualizing the data. So for, for a real specific example, what we did, we took uh, the telematics data that was coming off of the vehicles. Um, and typically when we get that data um, from, uh, from our telematics providers, we get... Um, 100,000 columns and a couple million rows worth of, of data about all of the various trips um, that your car would, would go on. Um, and historically what we'd done was we would try to uh, put together some graphs and things to, to show this. Well, what my team did was we actually took that data and uh, created what we called trip replay. Um, basically, we, we were able to emulate um, the, the trip and show you on a map um, your trip as it happened. Um, show you where you turned, show you when you slowed down, when you sped up. We showed you what the weather was and we were able to help you visualize in a different way what really happened in that trip. Um, and, and it was interesting because that gave um, a human being uh, who had a completely different mental model around what should and shouldn't happen um, a different way to look at and evaluate the data. And so I think as, as we look at um, all the data coming off of, um, uh, of the, the sensors and all of the different use cases, I think we have to be creative and, and, and think of different ways to visualize and, and be able to comprehend that data um, as human beings um, because I think that's kind of how we're going to gain really, truly unique insight from it. Yeah, insight's a key. Any other questions? Yes. Ron. What I, what Wait I for me. We got, we got a mic coming. Thanks. What I heard from Johan, who gave the presentation from Shell, he, he said that you needed to separate the data from the application. He also made it very, very crystal clear you have to add the metadata to it before you get it into this neutral central repository of some nature, call it a data lake if you want to, but you need to add the metadata to it. And that's, I think, key to everybody. Separate the data from the application and get add the metadata so that any application that needs that data is, is able to use that data and generate new data, which obviously is the reason you would extract the data, is to generate something new. But then when that new data gets created, it goes into the repository with additional metadata so that you know what that new data is. And that's, I think that's key for everybody. 
It, yeah, it, and it's it's always been key, right? I, I think you know if you see ones and zeros, you don't know why they're there. You, you can't do anything with it. Linda, I think there's one in the back. Linda. Ah, way in the back. Okay, you're gonna make Linda work for this one. <laughs> Yes, uh, you made a comment earlier about uh, the President of the United States being a uh, contract worker or something like that. Uh, that that made me think because uh, I, I talked to a lot of the petroleum refineries here in Houston regarding cybersecurity and cyber terrorism on their chemical plants, but they're all using Windows. So, when, so I tell them, how can you be secure using Windows? Why don't you just download open source Linux uh, reconfigure it, put all the patches in where you know it is, and say, well, we're not in the IT business. We're in the oil business. And so uh, I think they should be more in the IT business mm -hmm. because they're responsible, as you were saying, right? Mm -hmm. How can we get there? I think we're moving away from there. So um, oh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good observation, and it sort of confirms my suspicion about what is going on. Unfortunately, I think you, you need to have a disaster before you, uh, you really get people to change their mindset. But there is an aspect, and that goes back to saying, well, there is an IT department within that organization. There is a, a, a CIO and a, and a risk officer of some sort. So they should think about these kind of things. And IT needs to make it easier. It isn't necessarily easier to, to download the open source Linux and get it running because somebody had invested uh, something in a, in a closed uh, platform and then you need to recompile all of that before you can actually get it secured. But, uh, but, but IT needs to be that equivalent to the financial officers that really takes responsibility. And I, and I think uh, you said it also, Michael, earlier. It, it's it's you got to change the mindset. You're, you're a technology company that's getting oil out of the ground and transforming it to your you know something you can consume. I think I think that's where where the digital business flip kind of comes into play in my mind. Yeah, coming back to you know role of IT in enterprise. Uh, <clears throat> so our observation, we hear from lot many companies the te technology and IT spending of every enterprise is going up and up, but CIO budget is going down and down. So how do you explain this or interpret this contradiction? Anybody want to take a shot at that? Yeah. Well, that everything goes in waves, and there is a degree of saying it's the, the, the who has the responsibility for the budget um, is not the same as who has responsibility for, for the rules and regulations of, of what is going on. Um, but um, eventually, um, technology will consume the, the business and be the entire um, expenditure you have anyway. Anybody else? Well, I guess I had mentioned it before, but, you know, if that, and, I, and I've seen that exact case, as, as Lars pointed out, I think... Um, IT's got to simplify process, have to look at more automation, and can can look at the reduction in costs. I don't, I don't think they look at it. I don't think. I think just through the 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 changes that can happen from organizationally and to a different model of service delivery. If think think about them bringing IT bringing more to the table in innovation, and again getting away from the cost center that Lars had mentioned. Um, I, I think they can drive uh, cost out of running IT, and they can also drive innovation that will bring more into the business. I don't think, and, and visiting a lot of different organizations, enough organizations map what IT is, is doing to the business and saying, what, what are my business goals? What are my business initiatives? If I want to increase my profit by 10% or my margin by X or whatever else, how can I use technology to do that and then map the services that IT is delivering to that? I think that's where you can start to look at saying, okay, I have a shrinking budget, but I'm driving innovation, I'm driving um, bottom line to the business. And I think a lot of it's becoming, you know, being transparent, you know, showing basically 
what's where the money's going. I think a lot of organizations can't do that very well, they, and, and it becomes a bit of a back, black box. So they create the alienation, um, and they, they can create their own their own grave basically as a result. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I would, I would, I would build on that just a little bit. I think the bar is is higher than it's ever been before, and I think yeah. that's why the the spend is shifting. The the chief digital officer can go out and swipe his or her credit card and have IT. Yeah. And if they want to go to the IT shop within their organization, they probably have to talk to a business relationship manager who's going to work through the portfolio management process to approve the budget, who's then going to bring in a business analyst, who's then going to gather all the requirements, who's then going to talk to a project manager who's then going to go get a developer to go build it out after they work with their architect who's blah, 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 right? So for them, it's, okay, I can swipe my credit card or I can go spend the six, next six months talking to IT to figure out how to do the same thing. And so they swipe their credit card. And, and frictionless. So, yeah, so, mm -hmm. so I have an example of a, of a service provider in the medical industry in Denmark that we work with. And they were originally an internal IT department and had all of these problems. They were split out as a separate organization needed to compete with the Amazon. And they compute, I can't remember the exact number, maybe a factor five more expensive to get a server within that service provider than in Amazon. But they realized, well, they need to explain it, not to make it cheaper, but explain why it was five times more expensive. It was five times more expensive because it was a compliance server. And the, uh, so, so it was a backdrop, it was following all the change uh, processes that FDA requires, et cetera. And, and so, okay, if you only just want a server, swipe the card and get going, that's efficient. You, they don't want to compete with Amazon on that. Um, but if you want all of these things with it, um, then uh, you can take it here. But they also put it in the catalog so you can get it within, if not an hour, then a day, and not three months, because that was needed in order to compete. So there's a lot about making it explicit what is the value you're bringing with your services, which implies you need to think about services and not about technology, and that's a big shift for IT. And the ones that can't shift, they're going to be irrelevant eventually. Yeah. And we have to think about seamless service delivery. Absolutely. There you go. Exactly. All right. I think we're a little past our time now. I wanted to thank the panelists here, John, Michael, and Lars. Thank you. And uh, excellent questions also from the audience. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark.